So this is a uh, sponsored uh, lectures by Klaus Nord. And um, other than that, I run my own air workshops called Tester in Malaysia. There's collaborating, uh, collaborations with the uh, emergency, uh, college of emergency uh, physicians in Malaysia. And we have multiple other industrial vendors and collaborations as well. So I'm not an airway expert, just an enthusiast. So hopefully you can learn something from this lecture. So this is the hospital that I'm working in. Uh, 136 years old by this year, since 1882. So uh, it's one of the few hospitals that had a sea view. A lot of patients, so our turnover rate is for 700 per day in the emergency department. So we see a lot of cases. It's the only hospital with a full equipped trauma team and uh, surgical uh, facility. So we receive a lot of trauma cases as well. So my core contents for the talk today will be so my core contents for the talk today will be a brief development of VL just to go through a little bit of the history and uh, the importance of visual uh, airway management because nowadays we prefer to see everything with our own naked eyes for confirmation and an overview of the challenges in airway management mostly in terms of um, anesthesiology department as well as emergency department and the roles of VL in clinical area management, as well as some tips and troubleshoots uh, for VL in emergency and the curricular intubations. And last but not least, along the way, we'll have a few uh, recent literature reviews to support, uh, to support any evidence that is related to VL. I hope so far it's a bit. I'll speak a little slowly. Okay, so this is just a brief history on development of VL at one glance. So starting from the very early, as you could see, from the 19th century, I think the only area management is tracheostomy. And subsequently, we have Benjamin, this guy over here, that developed a concept called glottoscope or glottoscopic. And after that, we have um, laryngoscope in the 20th century that is firstly introduced by Dr. Thomas Hodgkin. And after that, we have um, Alfred Kersmeyer. I think a few of you, or maybe uh, most of you, are more familiar with Alfred, um, to pioneer the DL, direct laryngoscope that is conventionally used. And after that, we have Macintosh that is introduced uh, in 1943. And with that, we have divided rigid fiber optic. And later in 2000, and in the 21st century, since the digital revolution, we get uh, more varieties of VL on the market. So this is one of the prototype in 1943. So you have a handle with a light source. It's very ancient. And now in 2015, we have our own VL. So these are by stores. Of course, on the market, we have a few. So mainly, it's classified into three different groups. We have channel. We have the non-channel VL, and we have the angulated VL that um, we went through yesterday in one of the stations. <coughs> and these are all your portable VL that you can actually find on the market. So the main aims of having a VL are this. So we want to improve a lab, uh, our laryngoscopic view or your glottic view. We want to see more of VL actually. And we want to improve the first pass success rate because it's very important if we don't achieve the first pass success rate or the first attempt uh, success rate, we're going to get a lot of complications when we're in dealing with the emergency airway. So we want to aid the management of difficult airway or even challenging airway. And we want to use VL as a rescue device. And last but not least, our main aim is to improve patient safety and improve the outcome. So the challenges in airway management, you'll be surprised. By NET4 in 2015, these are the, uh, I think this doesn't happen in my hospital. We get around uh, three to four intubations per day. So I think per year we get more than that. And uh, difficult airway, it takes about maybe 20%. I think it's the same uh, figure as in the United States. So if you have a classic laryngoscopy that is failed, that means you have a CL of three or four. So you might have to perform blind intubation that it's not safe if you're using a DL. 
So you have a difficult intubations during the elective is about 3%, 1 to 3%. And you have failed tracheal intubations in all of these patients, which is defined uh, as BMI 1 in 30. You're going to get 1 in 250. So the number is actually alarming with DL, if that is the case. So after that, what about those that you cannot intubate and you can't ventilate, or you call key core rescue, you cannot intubate and you can't oxygenate, that is about 0.01 to 0.03%. And the emergency area management, like the place that I'm working in, outside the OT, we don't have the luxury of so having the patients on the elective, so we have more troubles. We're going to have all these complications. It could be a direct airway trauma. It could be a hemorrhage into the airway. It could be a lung injury that limiting pre oxygenation which is a very important step under your resuscitative or your rapid sequence situation. Physiological compromise, critically hypovolemic. And the next thing you know, patient is going to go into PEA and you have to start your resuscitation. Surgical airway by near, this is by ASAP because um, American College of Emergency Physicians does uh, make an impact on the figures. In ED itself, we get 0.5% of the airway. So one of the Scottish study, 8.5% undergo IRSA in uh, ED, actually has a CL of 3 and 4. Registry give a very alarming figure. About 93% of the emergency array is unanticipated area. So the problem with the mentality nowadays, um, I think we do not anticipate difficult array in most of our patients. So I think my principle of teaching the array will be anticipate difficult array or challenging array in every single patient they're going to put a tip in. I think in that case, you will have a better preparation, a better plan. And 45% of out of this 93% were actually difficult intubations when they anticipated. So you have your, I think Dr. Susie mentioned yesterday, you have this uh, thorough mental distance. So anything more than 6 cm, you can anticipate this could be a CL3 or 4. So you will be a difficult area. Uh, next slide. So if you look at the PubMed publications over the years, you're going to get a rise in the VL publications. So um, up to date, I would say we have about 60 to 65 randomized control trials comparing the benefits of VL as well as the disadvantages of VL. So what are the intubation related complications? You mean a lot to me, especially uh, the place I practice. This most of the patients, uh, you don't really have like a, you know, we don't have luxurious time. Once we need to intervene with the airway, the patient is usually very critically ill and very sick. So those are the complications. The main thing that is going to kill the patients will be hypoxemia. Okay? And of course, unrecognized is a major intubation, more so in a pre-hospital care setting, and on the ambulance, if we're going to perform an endotracheal intubations, Mostly, it's going to get esophageal intubation. So, right main stem bronchus intubation, pulmonary aspiration, hemodynamic evacuation. Um, later, we'll talk about a concept called hop killers. So, before you intubate a patient, you will like to prevent, and you will make sure that you prevent hop killers. We'll come to that. So, this is a paper published by uh, SACOS in 2013 you will be alarmed that you get about 14.2% of complications despite you achieve a first pass success. So the first time you introduce your tube into the airway, you still get about 14.2% of complications. So the number actually for triple. It will go up if you attempt more than three times. And that's where we define it as difficult airway. So first shot is always the best shot. 
We want the first shot to be the successful shot. So the multiple attempts that you're going to do, you're going to create that net. So all these papers say the same thing. They support that, and they'll try to prevent and try to achieve first class success. So can we actually do better with uh, BL? Um, uh, maybe most of you attended yesterday's uh, workshop, so hopefully you think that BL actually helps you in uh, one way or another. So this one is uh, a few papers uh, that is uh, that have been published over the years. So we talk about great, uh, greater first class success in your intubations and uh, ICU intubations if you use BL, and and you get a, bad, a better first class success with BL among novices if you are doing uh, training programs. If those people are inexperienced, they are first timers. If you use BL, actually you improve their chance of getting first class success. And of course, in a predicted difficult airway, which I hope that everyone anticipates difficult airway, in all the patients that you're going to intubate, you're going to get a first class success with BL as well. And of course, you, uh, it's associated with fewer esophageal intubation. So this one, BL improves laryngeal view during laryngoscopy. Let's see whether it's true. You see more with BL. So yesterday we mentioned about the angle of view that you're going to see. So you get a Macintosh that is normally quite close to your conventional direct laryngoscopy. You're going to get about 45 degrees of view. So if you use a hyperangulated for more anterior larynx, you're going to get about 60 degrees of view. So this is a conventional direct laryngoscopy, which only gives you 15 degree of view. And whatever you see, the other people or your team members can't view. They can't see the things you see. So take a look here. This is what you see and nobody else sees in the room when you're managing an airway. And this is a little laryng laryngeal view that you could get from a DL. Again, comparing DL to VL, you see more with VL. So this is one of the concepts called the uh, two-curve theory. As I think it's quite uh, uh, well-versed among the anesthesiology world. Uh, it's by Greenland in 2008. So he talks about how the primary curve can be improved with your blade. That is how the, the, the technology of a laryngoscope, either a VL or DL, mostly VL of course, um, after 2008, how they developed their VL technology based on this uh, principle to actually flatten out the primary curve, the one in red. So again, this is just another diagram to show you the degree of view that you can get with VL, MDL, and angulated blade. All right, so you see more in VL, you get to see all this. All right, this other thing we might not anticipate in the emergency department because most are every emergency. So we are not be able to see well if we don't have a VL. And with DL, we might fail the first class success. So yesterday we talked about the concept of epiglottoscopy is to say the epiglottis whenever you try to introduce a blade into the oral cavity and into the glottic opening. So if you can get a VL, you'll be able to see your epiglottis clearly. And you will be able to identify which is the black hole that you're going to introduce your tube. From the first picture, of course, functional anatomy is important. You need to know the basic of functional anatomy. So you have your esophagus opening and your glottic opening. So without a VL, you might be mistaken that the esophageal opening is the glottic opening, and hence, you get a esophageal intubation. So again, 
you will able to get a real time visualization of a passage of an ETT into the glottic opening and sit nicely at the cricoid line, which is here, so that you don't go too deep and you will go into the right main stand or the right bronchus, main bronchus. So you can actually get to see that and you don't complicate the issues by having the patients breathing on the one lung. when you encounter a sore airway. I think uh, it happens in the OT. And of course, uh, what we call uh, for help from the anesthesia colleague, this is going to happen. You see this. When you have a sore airway, you can't see anything. We don't like to do that. We don't like to bend forward and try to attempt a, VL, a DL. Because if the patient is vomiting a lot, it just doesn't taste, sound, smells good, okay? And it's very messy. So we prefer standing up. With a BL, you can actually stand up. And whatever you see, the whole team can see as well. And you can avoid, you can know where to suck. Let's say you want to uh, perform a suction, and your team members is next to you, and they're seeing what you're seeing, they will be able to direct the suctions to the place that has a lot of secretions and mostly of course it's from the east of Vegas. So VL is a rescue device. Yes, when you have a first attempt failure, you can use a VL to help you to pass the tube again. So it's one of the guidelines under DAS, which is the typical area society. So one of the rescue devices they can consider, let's say if you fail a direct laryngoscope, you can proceed with video laryngoscope. So clinical performance of VL in difficult airway, how well are we doing? So difficult airway characteristics, I'm sure we know, we are quite uh, uh, aware of that. We get a lot of uh, you know, intubations and uh, failure especially when the intubator thinks that this is a difficult airway. We can get a reduced neck mobility, or even sometimes the patient comes in with a cervical spine collar, and we have to keep the collar. And what about those patients that is very obvious? Nowadays, we get a lot of BMI of more than 35, comes in with a lot of complications. And more so, in my setting, this is a trauma center, so we'll get a lot of facial, make both facial injury as well as we get a lot of blood and vomitus in the airway. It's a nightmare. It's we on the floor, you have to take care 